Hi everyone, I hope you're all healthy and well. Welcome to the next talk in our Golden Webinars in Astrophysics series. My name is Evelyn Johnston and together with Thomas Putzia, we have organized today's webinar for you. As in our previous webinars, we have arranged for simultaneous language interpretation provided by Mr. Patricio Gonzalez, who will be simultaneously in, uh, translating for us into Spanish. En sus dispositivos pueden escuchar a la interpretación al español de la conferencia al pinchar el botón de interpretación que se encuentra en la parte inferior derecha de la ventana de Zoom. También vamos a publicar algunas instrucciones en la ventana de chat que se puede activar con el botón chat abajo. As there is no such thing as its pre-lunch, we'd like to first of all acknowledge the, generals, the generous support of the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA for its Spanish acronym. Thank you so much for all your feedback and comments. If you're watching a recording of this talk on YouTube later on, please leave your comments and questions below. And please share these talks with your friends and colleagues. If you would like to support the Golden Webinar series um, or give us feedback, please send us an email. If you have any questions during the talk, please send them through the Q&A window. You can also upvote questions and comment on them. We will select the best questions for the discussion after the talk. Before we begin, we would like to briefly introduce our panel members that are with us today. So Joe, our speaker, of course, Patricio, Evelyn, and myself from the faculty of the Institute of Astrophysics at Pontificia Universidad Católica. We have Alejandro Clochiati, Rolando Dunner, and from the Institute of Physics at our university, we have Jorge Alfaro and the Dean of the Faculty of Physics of our university, Max Bañaros, with us. We also have our student, um, Enrique Paillas, who is a graduate student at the Institute of Astrophysics. We also have the great pleasure of welcoming our guest panelists today, Leopoldo Infante, who is the director of Las Campanas Observatory, Joe Primack, who is a distinguished professor of physics emeritus at the University of California in Santa Cruz, and Daniel Scherer, who is a professor at the Department of Astronomy at the University of Geneva. Finally, we have also our excellent team of Q&A managers with us today, Ricardo Acevedo, Daniela Fernandez, and Carol Rojas. It is our pleasure to introduce Joe Silk as our speaker today. Joe studied maths at the University of Cambridge before moving to Harvard for his PhD in astronomy, which he was awarded in 1968. He has had postdoctoral fellowships at Cambridge and Princeton and moved to Berkeley in 1970, where he was, ultimate, he was uh, appointed as a chair of astronomy in 1978. He worked at Berkeley for nearly 30 years, uh, leaving in 1999 to become the civilian chair of astronomy at the University of Oxford. He is currently the professor of physics at the Institut d'Astrophysique de Paris, Université Pierre et e. uh, Marie Curie, and the Homewood Professor of Physics and Astronomy at John Hopkins University since 2010. His research included some of the important early work on inhomogeneities in the cosmic microwave background and how they are influenced by density fluctuations in the matter of the early universe, in particular by a damping effect that bears his name. These were decisive contributions that helped transform cosmology into a high precision, high precision science. He has also made pioneering advances in understanding the nature of dark matter and explored novel indirect methods for its detection. The latter have inspired very large experiments with new types of telescopes. Throughout his career, he has been awarded numerous prizes, among which are the Balsam Prize for his work on the early universe in 2011. And in 2019, he was jointly awarded the Gruber Prize in Cosmology together with Nicholas Kaiser for their seminal contributions to the theory of cosmological structure formation and probes of dark matter. But enough about the past. Today, Joe will tell us all about the future of cosmology. Joe, please take it away. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's very confusing with all these time zones involved. But first, let me thank um, Evelyn and Thomas for, the, for this invitation, which I will try to live up to, to tell you uh, my thoughts on where we might be going, maybe even should be going, in cosmology in the next decades. So let me begin with a remark about my hero in cosmology, Georges Lemaitre, who, um, as shortly after getting his PhD, he got obsessed with cosmology, um, visiting Caltech, talking to the observers there, 
And um, in his notebook at the time, he sketched out um, the first um, uh, modern version of the Big Bang Theory, in which he had both um, radiation and ordinary matter, of course, but also um, uh, the effects of dark matter to some extent too, or all matter. But the, so the matter was decelerating by its gravity, but he then introduced dark energy in this um, very um, adventurous way um, because he knew a lot about how the universe should be evolving from the beginning. So he thought he was arriving in the field very early in the days of um, quantum physics and was able to bring to bear some of the ideas. And um, he uh, really wanted um, to believe that the universe could possibly, um, uh, you know, accelerate and live forever. And behind this then, let's look in slightly more detail at, um, at what he did. What, here's um, uh, a very poorly known paper of his, but a key paper that he wrote in 1933, where he, in order to um, produce this, um, his beloved model of a universe which um, would be accelerating, he introduced the idea of, um, of uh, dark energy, what we now call dark energy. He called it dark energy even effectively. Um, it was a cosmological constant um, in those days. And um, it acts um, as a negative pressure um, because positive pressure is self-gravitating, ne negative pressure is accelerating. And, um, and he said very clearly, this was the meaning of his cosmological constant in addition to Einstein's um, uh, uh, equ equations, um, and it, it acts as an accelerator of the universe. And so we have this wonderful idea coming out with quantum mechanics um, included in the definition in 1933. So the question is now, what's happened in the past, you know, uh, 90 years. How much progress has there been? And um, the answer is, I would say not a whole lot, because here we are with um, uh, shortly after the experimental verification of the acceleration of the universe um, in uh, around 1998, uh, we have one of the more deep first early surveys from 2001 where you see um, the value of this um, dark energy constant, this equation of state parameter that the major hypothesized minus one with huge error bars. Um, and the data was to get better over the next two decades. And flashing forward to this year, you can see that um, when I look at this magic parameter, which gives me the, the negative pressure and, and corresponds to a cosmological constant, minus one, um, we've greatly reduced the error bars, but it's still firmly centered on the cosmological constant. And the, 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 the sad thing about this is, is that we have no idea uh, what the origin of this constant is in physics that we know about. Um, we um, now commonly call this, um, uh, this source of acceleration dark energy, uh, but we're lacking any understanding of it. And to get an understanding of something, normally you measure it more and more accurately, this, this, this quantity. And um, you can see um, the current experiments are converging on a constant. There's no hint of any um, new physics out there, which is a bit disappointing. You have to ask the question as we proceed in the next decades with more refined experiments, um, we will, of course will be looking for deviations but so far, there's no reason to believe that there will be any. Um, the other major component of the modern theory of the expanding universe is the dark matter, which of course was um, unknown when Lemaitre originally um, proposed his idea for the acceleration, but became talked about very soon afterwards, actually, um, thanks to the work of 
Fritz Vicky and others from, from again, the early 1930s onwards. And it, 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 it is clear that th this represents 90% of the matter of the universe um, from modern observations. And we're struggling to identify it. We measure, of course, the radiation content in the microwave background. Um, we measure the stars around us and infer the gas content also of the universe. So we measure the ordinary matter of the baryons. But the dominant dark component is a mystery. And we need that to explain the rate at which our universe is expanding and the properties of, of, of the universe. So how are we doing in this search for this elusive component of the universe? Well, um, we think that it's most likely some fundamental particle here um, denoted by, by chi. And the idea is that um, in, uh, you, you know, you go to an, you devise an experiment. In this case, it's going deep underground to avoid contamination from cosmic rays. And you look for the effects of dark matter particles scattering on, on protons um, and nothing has been seen. Um, another option is to explore the interaction of dark matter particles with each other. In many cases, they, um, uh, they would annihilate with themselves um, and give you gamma rays. We've looked hard for gamma rays um, in the regions of the galaxy where dark matter dominates. In dwarf galaxies, laboratories for dark matter, and so far, nothing. Um, the final uh, um, way of, um, of looking is to go to um, an accelerator um, and there um, you see an experiment at CERN um, colliding highly protons against each other and looking for the occasional um, possible indication that a dark matter particle might be produced uh, and as would be seen by missing momentum. So in fact, um, nothing has been seen, all very depressing. However, this need not mean that there is no dark matter because the parameter space um, of dark matter is huge. In this plot, let me not even tell you exactly what the coordinates are, but you can notice a tiny part, these are decades in each axis, and we've only begun to explore tiny parts. So there could be dark matter, which would involve inventing newer physics, the, the different types of physics. Um, maybe the most intriguing candidate to date um, are primordial black holes. Um, these are fascinating objects. Um, it's the one type of dark matter particle that we are sure actually exists. That is the black hole, um, because we've actually measured them most recently via the gravity wave emission. Now, black holes that we see for the most part are thought to be produced by very massive stars, but there could be, and it's even plausible that there should be, um, early fluctuations of the universe, deviations of the very early universe, which gave rise to forming tiny black holes. We haven't seen them yet, um, but they are a candidate for the dark matter. And the intriguing thing is that because the early, uh, early universe when these were formed is so hot, even a tiny sprinkling of these fluctuations would eventually be important at late times in the universe. So ideas like this come from the theory of inflation. So this is a modern theory of the expansion of the universe um, developed roughly 30 years ago. Um, and it, it, it has the very um, uh, interesting prediction that one can start from essentially nothing or very, very little, one can debate this, but there's a period of exponential growth, rapid acceleration, reminiscent of Lemaitre's constant, but now at a very early stage. And then lo and behold, we have um, eventually gravity takes over and um, structures form, we have our galaxies. So it's a wonderful theory, partly because one, one can begin with quantum fluctuations of the type that Lemaitre even conjectured about, and inflation blows them up into macroscopic structures. Anyway, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a theory that has met with many successes observationally. And so let me um, mention its key predictions. And so they are, for example, that 
space should be flat. Imagine your, a, a wrinkled balloon being blown up many orders of magnitude, it becomes incredibly flat locally. And the same is true in three dimensions. The universe should be huge. And most exciting, especially for the observational astronomers, is that it predicts these blown up quantum fluctuations as the source of large scale structure. And that seems to work very well when we measure these seed fluctuations in the fossil radiation from the Big Bang. However, um, I'll come back to that later, but um, what this theory does need, however, is dark matter because the baryon, the ordinary matter alone, is not really enough to account for the flatness of space uh, and all the extra matter you need to guarantee that. If we take our observed matter, then the universe would um, expand forever. It would not, um, it would not have enough matter in to, um, to verify that space was flat. That's a universe that just barely expands forever, but has lots of dark matter in, and we don't haven't found dark matter yet. Likewise, um, with the, this deficit of dark matter is now measured as well, cosmologically speaking, and we've learned that it, again, in order to produce flatness of space, we need what we call what we have called dark energy. Um, the same, uh, most simply, most possibly likely, as Lemaitre's cosmological constant. It is until we find deviations of that constant. But we have no understanding of what this dark energy is, what gave rise to it. And that's, that's a worry. And so all these issues begin to cast a little shadow on our knowledge of how inflation worked. So what we have to do is, apart from the wonderful observation indicators we have of inflation, um, we, have, we, need, we need more, more predictions, more things to verify um, and, and one of them is that inflation predicts um, a gravity wave background from the fluctuations that are highly asymmetric. Um, they're produced in so-called tensor mode as well as the scalar mode that, that needs ordinary fluctuations. And these um, leave a background which we haven't measured yet. So we're gonna measure this someday, we hope. Um, we talk about the tensor scalar ra ratio. The current limit is about 10% and it has to be improved greatly. Galaxy formation is predicted to, from these fluctuations I mentioned, um, but again, we have no real confirmation about what happened in the very early universe, and we expect to measure that from the effects of the fluctuations on the microwave background, which I'll come to in a second. But maybe the most exciting prediction of all, um, because these others are difficult, and you may, as I'll show in a second, maybe uh, not guaranteed, but what is guaranteed is the non-Gaussianity, the deviations from, from complete um, randomness, if you like, in, in the early fluctuations, which modern inflation models almost generically predict. The only problem is these are incredibly small. They're quadratic in the temperature fluctuations, if you like, which are themselves very small, order parts in 10,000. And so you have to do an amazing job to get this. And, um, uh, and that is what I want to tell you about next, how we might go there. Okay, so as of, um, as of now, um, the microwave background, this is the wonderful map from the Planck uh, satellite, um, it shows these fluctuations at the um, micro Kelvin level, which are the seeds that eventually gravity enhanced and made the galaxies around us as, uh, as they seeded density, uh, density fluctuations that eventually collapsed. Um, however, what we ideally want to do to go beyond this, to get back closer to inflation, um, is to look for the gravity wave uh, background um, produced um, inevitably in generic models of inflation, in many generic models, um, may, maybe not all models, but it seems to be very, very common. And we have to do a thousand times better than we are today. And that involves um, not looking at micro Kelvin sensitivities, but doing a thousand times better. And the way you do that is by adding many more detectors. So the best experiments we've had to date are with the Planck satellite and before that the WMAP satellite with you know, up to a hundred detectors. And they, that's got us to micro Kelvin level. Um, we have to add more and more detectors. So detectors in space are very important. We're projecting a launch in 2027 with a Lightbird satellite. Detectors on the ground are not quite as effective. One needs many more of them. 
And that we're going up to huge numbers of detectors in the next few years on the ground. And these are pictures of some of these experiments. But the problem is that um, we have this wonderful um, uh, prediction, um, uh, that's the solid line here, of, of the density fluctuations. The error bars are, are remarkably good and fit that very well. Um, and we also are beginning to see indications of polarization from, from the effects of, of um, dark matter, basically. But what, what we are looking for is this tensor mode, which is down here with huge error bars, in particular where this big red question mark is, because these other effects are caused by slightly more mundane processes. This is where we're looking for a mysterious signal of the Big Bang. And the problem is that the predicted value is uncertain. If it happens to be at the higher level of this enormous range, we'll have a very good chance of finding it in the next five years. But if um, inflation is not quite as helpful as one might like, um, we can say there is no guarantee of a primordial signal. So that's a little bit worrying for the future of cosmology. Um, so what I want to turn to now is what I think is the ultimate goal of cosmology, and it's largely unexplored. And this is what we call the Dark Ages. So the Dark Ages are before there were any stars at all, and but after the radiation um, that we see as the fossil microwave background separated from the matter, allowing us a clear view of hydrogen clouds. Um, in the all the way back to a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. These hydrogen clouds must be, must be there because they are the seeds, they are the building blocks of the galaxies. And so we're looking for these, these building blocks. And because the matter is colder than the microwave background, we can hope to see them in absorption against the microwave background. And this way, um, by studying vast numbers of these building blocks, are looking at the distribution in space, we can hope to probe what I would say is the most robust prediction of the inflationary model, namely this, namely this primordial long Gaussian that I talked about, this, this, this degree of not quite um, randomness in the fluctuations that should be a signature of, of the inflation models that we understand. It's been predicted to be so. So um, why is this such an amazing, uh, possibility that can be addressed with the dark ages. So here roughly is why. Um, when you look at the microwave background, so this shows you a function of, um, of, of the precision in the fluctuation level as you go to smaller and smaller length scales. So the microwave background basically pro probes very large angular scales or equivalent scales of galaxies in the universe, but actually not galaxies, really clusters and larger scales. And at that point, the fluctuations um, become diffused by the effects of the radiation. So you, cu you cut things off. So when you look at the microwave background and you re recover the, 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 this, these fluctuations that you see in the Planck map of the sky, the temperature fluctuations, you have on the order of a million pixels on the sky, um, and that limits the precision at which you can um, measure these fluctuations. And so one over the square root of the number of modes, that means you're roughly looking at 0.1 precision in the microwave background. And if we want to get down to really testing inflation, we've got to do much, much better. So what is happening now? Are we getting ready for a whole new generation of large scale structure experiments, um, including um, the, uh, the, the, the Rubin Observatory, LSST as it was. Um, and this will monitor billions of galaxies with red shifts, um, but it will actually, um, if we think of how many galaxies it takes to give you reliable points on your graph, if you like, we think we'll maybe have of order 100 million modes from large scale structure servers, including satellite experiments and ground based experiments that are probing deep into the universe. So this gives us a factor of 100 more modes or a factor of 10 increase in precision. Okay, but to get down to this very, very elusive goal of testing inflation, we've got to do at least 10 times better. 
And if you think about it, there's only one way to do this really, I think, and that is by going to many, many more modes. And that the obvious place to do that, I think is in the dark ages, where you have all these building blocks of galaxies. So you have for a galaxy, uh, maybe it's building block, was a million solar masses. So you have a hundred thousand building blocks or more per galaxy. And these are clouds and you could look at them. They're cold clouds against the microwave background. And how you look at them, well, your best bet is at 21 centimeters. You can see the gas um, in absorption against the background. It's a, it's a well demonstrated way to measure cold gas. Um, but because you're going so far back in time to do this, um, you basically have to go to incredibly low frequencies. Uh, we're talking about measuring, um, you know, at rev shifts of 50. Remember, our, the deepest have gone so far is seven or eight. The microwave background, of course, is beyond that at, at a thousand. So it's well within the range of, of, of um, physics that we can probe already, but it's very, very difficult to do. But if we can do this, we can open up many more modes um, and because you can work in three dimensions when you measure redshift as opposed to with a microwave background, where you see the fluctuations spit on the sky in two dimensions, you get even more modes. So getting a trillion modes is by no means impossible. Eventually, there are, there are of course many problems, but, and it would get us the precision we need maybe to really begin to probe inflation. Okay, so let me now put this on a slightly firmer footing. So again, to summarize, the microwave background um, will get us down to 0.1% precision, 0.1 precision, um, 10 minus three, and we'll do that. And that's, you know, basically we're getting very close to that in cosmology at the moment, um, but we'll do better in the next few years and, uh, and be able to probe this non gaussianity at this level. Using galaxies gets a hundred times more modes with these new experiments, um, and that'll get us a factor of 10 further. But what we, what we really need to do is to go to um, uh, these many tiny clouds, which are the precursors of, these, of this big galaxy over here, and see them in absorption against the background. And that will open up the, this trillion modes and get us down to incredible precision in principle, um, but I wouldn't hold my breath on this one. I'm estimating this might take us 20 years at least. I'll, I'll explain why as I go through my talk. So here you have the micro background on the left, um, the universe that we know on the right and the dark ages in between. And that's where you want to go. And um, let me just show you another way of, of visualizing the effect that we're looking for. So, so this is in the reverse direction. I and mean, as you go back in time, um, we're, we are on the left at redshift zero. You, you go back to redshift 50 or so, ideally, this shows you the signal that you're looking for, the deviation um, uh, of the hydrogen uh, being colder than the microwave background. And it's complicated because, you know, nearby in the universe, there's lots of heating from stars. So it's, it's, it's emission, it's warmer. Um, when you go back for a while, it turns out that um, uh, the first stars, early stars produce lots of um, Lyman alpha photons, which couple uh, the, the, the hydrogen spin temperature, the gas temperature. So you get absorption, but it's produced by stars. But what you ultimately want is the dark ages, no stars whatsoever. And then the gas is colder for a while until you get back to the decoupling epoch at 1000. And there you can in principle look in absorption against the microwave background and in principle get this wonderful return if you could ever measure all these modes. But you've got to do this a redshift of about 50 which means you know 30 megahertz or thereabouts. Okay, so there's really only one place uh, feasible for us in the next uh, century, let's say, um, to do uh, astronomy at such low frequencies, and that is on the far side of the moon. So this is the most radio quiet environment in the entire inner solar system. You don't have any of these worrying effects from the earth contaminating you like marine radar, cell phones, whatever. Um, and you can look at these low frequencies. And um, this is one uh, sketch of, of, a, of, a, uh, of, a, of a design for laying out mylar strips over hundreds of kilometers um, because you're looking at a wavelength of 10 meters that the odd rock or two doesn't matter too much on the surface. 
Um, and uh, by building an interferometer with a relay satellite to send signals back to Earth, um, you know, you might hope you could do something at low frequencies. Um, uh, the numbers that you need are, you're looking at redshift 50, you're looking at um, 30 megahertz, wavelengths of 10 meters. You need to get a resolution that um, is somewhat larger than that of, of the microwave background. Um, and you need an array which you can estimate to get you the enough sensitivity with this interferometer spread over 100 kilometers or so. And that way you'd have millions of dipoles. And you're looking for a very weak signal in a bright foreground with radiation from the Milky Way, basically, um, of 1,000K for this 10 millik signal. Sounds impossible, but remember, we did do miracles with the microwave background going from three degrees Kelvin down to micro Kelvin and soon, uh, in a few years, nano Kelvin even. And is this, is this number of, of, you know, of a million dipoles crazy? Well, we're planning already to build the low frequency version of the SKA with 100,000 antennas in 2025 or thereabouts. And so, you know, doing this robotically on the moon um, may uh, not be totally uh, so far-fetched as it might seem. So here's another design, a more recent one, for um, going again to the far side, um, finding a big crater, probably not too far from the South Pole. And you have here an Arecibo type radio telescope um, uh, with, with the um, receiver suspended over here. And um, this is a, perhaps a five kilometer crater, this design. And the idea here would be that you could really probe low frequencies, uh, 30 megahertz or whatever, um, and um, attain, um, uh, get, get very much into dark ages probing. And so that, that's a, an exciting design. Okay, so um, where do I think we're going um, with the future of cosmology? Um, the detection of primordial non-Gaussianity is really, uh, I think, the highest, the best goal we have if we want ultimately to have a guaranteed return that will test inflation. It's pretty much a generic prediction. The problem is that the number expected is of order 0.01 for the parameter that characterizes the non-Gaussianity. And to give you some feeling for what this is, the Planck limit on this number is 10 roughly. So you have to do a thousand times better than Planck. And it's easy enough to see where this number comes from um, there's a simple expression, the first given by Malacena, which says it's simply the scalar index minus one. The scalar index is 0 0.9, uh, 0 0.96 or thereabouts. And so you, you with, with error bars, so you, you get a, you know, you, that, that's the origin of this very small number. Okay, and because there's no prediction yet to take us away from minus one, there are many, or if you like, there are many predictions, but there's no, uh, you know, sturdy, robust prediction. For dark matter, there's no detection yet. We have so much parameter space to probe, so many ideas around to test. It's not clear when there will be a detection. Um, and using the tensor mode has no lower bound to it. Um, would be if we would be an amazing thing to find. We may be lucky, but um, there's no guarantee. But whereas the non-Gaussianity seems to be rather a robust prediction of the inflation theory. Um, so again, um, this is what we need to do. We have to beat this number down all the way to 0.01. Okay, so um, telescopes on the moon are, are good for low frequency radio astronomy. But if we're going to the trouble of building telescopes on the moon, we, it's good to have other goals too. And they're ideal for a number of other things that I want to sketch briefly. Um, and these are infrared astronomy um, and microwave background spectroscopy. And uh, here one can make um, pretty remarkable advances too. Um, and this will bolster our campaign to develop telescopes on the moon. So where would you put, um, uh, for example, um, an infrared telescope? So an ideal site is probably the following. You're not worried about radio interference, so you can go on, on the near side of the moon, but you want to go near the South Pole probably. Um, there are many large craters there, but the idea of going near a pole is the sun always is way down 
um, near the horizon. So you will never get excessive heating uh, actually. And in the center of the crater, because the sun is low down below the rims, you get perpetual darkness in, in some of the deeper craters. A great place to do astronomy. And what is more, um, they're measured to be incredibly cold, um, as cold as 30 Kelvin and contain ice as well. And so here's an image of the Shackleton crater, um, four kilometers deep, 21 kilometers wide, eternal darkness and perpetual sunlight on the rims. Um, a great source of solar power. And, um, and what is more, um, recent groups have found evidence for ice on the moon. It's very likely there are ice deposits in these, in these dark coal craters. And that's ideal again for um, all developing uh, various uh, programs to do construction and, um, and, uh, and fuel, develop fuel for, for rockets, et cetera, on the moon. So there are many motivations for developing this. Um, and um, uh, pushing to the moon. And astronomy will be, I think, a very important byproduct. So let me take you to the, um, to the infrared, okay? Um, and the, here's a design for an even uh, incredibly sophisticated infrared telescope, which will have a total aperture of 10 kilometers. It seems like a dream. Um, it would operate in the infrared. This is a design by, um, by Laberry, and his idea is to have many um, uh, mirror segments um, and their light is combined together interferometrically. Um, uh, and, you know, the principle of this has been demonstrated. Um, this is a huge scale up of what we can do. Um, but the idea is that um, uh, one could get a resolution um, in, of order tens of micro arc seconds. And with this resolution, that would be uh, an amazing way to image nearby planets. Um, and so here, for example, you have uh, a simulated image of the capability of what this could do um, in uh, a system which is within 100 parsecs or so. That's not all. Um, the moon's lower gravity enables you to do something you couldn't do on the Earth. We're limited with very big telescopes on the Earth by, 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 by stresses from winds and gravity, etc. ELT is our, is our largest projected telescope at 39 meters, but we've had a design in the past to build a 100 meter telescope, didn't work on the Earth, but imagine one could do similar things in dark craters on the moon, and that opens up a whole other type of interesting science. Um, first of all, um, you could then zero in on the first stars in the universe um, with um, uh, millisecond type uh, accuracy. Um, you would need interferometry, of course, to, do, to get there, but that would be a, an, amazing, um, uh, an, an amazing goal. Um, and what is more, with a telescope that's 100 meters in diameter, you could actually search for um, habitable planets. Um, these are ones with rocky cores in habitable zones around um, uh, around stars. And with this sort of size, you can go beyond the, the tens of parsecs range, 50 parsec range that current planet experiments are targeting. You could go to a much, much further kiloparsec range. And, and there are several hundred parsec range. They would have thousands of candidates and could look for signatures of bio, bio signature effects, which would be um, an interesting way to probe for um, life signals, basically. And so that, and with a large sample, that's crucial to this type of search. So that would be a, a huge step in that direction. Okay, then um, the final piece of science I want to draw your attention to, coming back to cosmology, is the wonderful things one could do um, on the moon with um, interferometry. Um, you have to, you can't do this on the Earth because of um, uh, the complicated molecular structure in the Earth's atmosphere, which. Uh, won't let you do an infrared spectrometry. Um, you do this in space. It was first done with a FIRAS um, spectrometer on COBE. And they set limits on deviations um, of the microwave background um, uh, measured to be a, a perfect black body of 2.725 Kelvin of parts in 10 to the fifth. Now, in principle, if the, uni if the early universe had any heat injection, 
this black line shows you the perfect right body, uh, the, the, the lighter line shows you the perfect right body, but the black line shows you the deviation. Photons are scattered from low to high energies. So um, let's see, sorry about that. Let me go back one. Um, and this deviation, which is called a mu, y distort a mu distortion in this case, would be a signal of early energy input, which could come from the first structures to form. The dark matter model that we, that we all love, so-called cold dark matter, any dark matter has to do this too, um, pr predicts st structure forming hierarchically from small scales to large scales. And the cold dark matter version of this, there must be many small things which interact with the radiation and basically leave a signal as they are damped out by photon drag. And this one could look for and test. It involves doing maybe a thousand times better than um, the fire ass experiment. An experiment planning to do this was called, was called, was called Pixie. Um, um, sorry, let me just get back into my, okay. Um, was called Pixie and that experiment um, uh, was rejected by, 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 by NASA twice. Um, because it didn't quite have the sensitivity um, to get to the goal um, that, that we need. Um, and so the, um, if one went to the moon, one could actually build a super pixie. And so this pixie itself was only a 55 centimeter telescope um, and uh, with a single detector, but one could imagine telescopes with many detectors um, and um, a much larger te telescope too. And that would get you down to the required range. And maybe the amazing thing that you could do with this um, would be to, um, to look for the recombination lines from the very early universe. That would be an amazing, that's a standard, a cast iron prediction of all big bang models. And that would be studying standard astrophysics at Redshift 1000. That would be an amazing thing to do. And this sort of experiment one could do on the moon. Okay. So um, the question is, this is expensive, who, who pays? So let me conclude with um, where are we gonna go on this? Well, there's a lot of talk now about, about going into space, going back to the moon. Um, President Trump is very much um, eager to push this. Um, we don't know what's gonna happen with him, of course, but um, commercializing the moon is a, is a huge part of this activity. But you know, astronomy could go along. One could do mining on the moon for rare, rare elements. One could do rocket fuel to help launch you into space. And Europe also is going to the act. Europe wants to build a space village on the moon. Um, uh, Amazon is going to the act. They wanted to deliver articles to the moon. Um, but maybe um, what is exciting is that we will, we have a little presence at the moment of human activity, but that will soon change. Um, NASA and also China hope to lend the first uh, woman and man also on the moon by 2024. And the most interesting uh, conclusion one can take from this is that if you remember that um, the Hubble Space Telescope, which you all know and love, was just a fraction of, of the cost of the shuttle, um, uh, the commercial interest in lunar tourism, mining fuel, you know, that would be hugely expensive for five or 10% of that we could do all of these wonderful experiments, you know, science. And that roughly was um, the, the way the space telescope was funded. It was just, you know, a order 5% of, of the space shuttle, National Space Station. So I think there's a great, it's a great time. There's great prospects. And this is the time we should be planning to, um, to go to the moon and making sure that science is included in the plans that our bosses are making to go to the moon. So thank you. Gracias. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, so Thomas has a question already. Go ahead, Thomas. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Joe. Um, so this is um, maybe a question that should be asked by uh, Joel, but um, there is this, um, so last week we had uh, the golden webinar by Adam Rees who told us this, this uh, crisis in cosmology now where we have um, faster expansion of the universe locally than predicted by the CMB propagation, right, forward. And 
Um, Joel is calculating with his team models that involve early, early dark energy components of the of the universe. So how how would this uh, crisis actually complicate going back to you know redshifts of thousand and and doing those experiments that you that you propose? Would degeneracies not be bought by this? Well, uh, look, look if there is um, a, a real Hubble tension if that survives and that makes that is a real indication that we've got away from constant lambda something intriguing uh, something is happening it may not be non-constant lambda, maybe something else but there is something new however I think it's a very dangerous business because this is not um, a direct measurement of distance it's indirect it uses supernovae um, that's the one you refer to there are other measurements using clusters other measurements using um, the most um, luminous red giant branch stars. And these do not necessarily all agree with each other. The latest cluster measurements are coming in at a, at a, at a lower value. The red giant branch, may, maybe uh, the red giant branch is coming in at a lower value. So, um, and there's even a paper just yesterday from um, the recent, um, most recent uh, gravity wave event, um, uh, pushing for a lower value to, uh, with the first gravity wave. So I, I don't think we really know anything. We don't, we don't know enough. We don't know enough about the observational errors, et cetera. So I would say um, it's not a strong argument at the moment for adding complexity to cosmology. We have no real convincing uh, pathway towards complexity beyond the metra's constant at the moment, as far as I can see. OK, uh, Jorge, you have a question? Yes, I have a couple of questions. The, the first is, thank you very much for the talk by the first place. Uh, the, the first question referred to the theoretical side. Uh, when you go to, uh, very early in the universe with inflation, you are, you are approaching very much the region of uh, bank time, so where uh, quantum gravity start to be important. So uh, the, uh, the question is if uh, uh, you expect some modification to inflation scenario because there you generally use quantum field theory that could break down when you start to include the quantum gravity uh, this is my first question and the second question is from the experimental point of view there is some prospect to uh, design experiment to detect the neutrino, neutrino cosmic background because that will uh, lead us very early in the universe much earlier than the photons so is, is there is a possibility to, to detect that background? Yes, yeah, so as far as um, the, the quantum beginning goes, I completely agree, we don't have a theory, um, but getting the primordial non-Gaussianity will be an important step in that direction. I mean, that, that is getting us as close as we possibly can, I think, to, 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 to that beginning. Um, and, um, you know, and demonstrating that it's a strong, we have a strong phenomenological theory with, with um, you know, that we can take back very close to the quantum uh, uh, physics moment, I think is a, is a great success already. And then um, uh, let's say your second question was, remind about me. About the neutrino cosmic background. Neutrino background. Yes, yeah, so there is an experiment underway, um, with, under design, using tritium endpoint decay to look for the neutrino background from cosmology, but it's incredibly difficult. And um, I, again, I don't think we should hold our breath for that, but that's the one I know about that will look for that. But that that's very exciting. And in principle, that will be another great test of um, the, the standard model of cosmology. Okay, let's go to Rolando next. Okay, so thanks uh, very much, Joe. It was a great talk and very illuminating. And um, I, I wanna ask why going to the moon is better than using more standard satellite technology, for example, using the second Lagrangian point. Okay, so one can do all the things I talked about in space. The moon is just a big, stable platform. That's the big advantage. So you can do things much bigger. And that's one reason. And the second reason is that um, if you want to do something really, really big in space, good luck, you'll never get the funding. But because we're going to be um, doing so much on the moon, using advanced robotics and many things, I think it's a great opportunity to take for science to persuade our, um, uh, our, our astronauts up there to, to give them projects to do that they, they would enjoy doing and would um, 
you know, be, be good for science. Right? So, you know, now is the time that these are being beginning to be explored. These ideas are being science on the move. Thanks. Uh, Joel? Uh, hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. So uh, I was a little surprised, Joe, that uh, you're as unconcerned as you say you are concerning the uh, uh, disagreements between local versus early universe measurements of the expansion rate. Uh, I particularly was impressed by the fact that not only do most of uh, the measurements using the distance ladder, of which you mentioned a few, agree uh, on a Hubble constant of about 73, but also a completely independent test using time delays of uh, uh, multiply imaged quasars is giving it essentially the same thing. And that's really uh, a non-distance ladder measurement. Uh, anyway, my question is, uh, are you concerned at all about other uh, tensions, in particular, the sigma eight or S eight tension? Uh, let me say also though, that uh, I really enjoyed your uh, promotion of uh, uh, astronomy on the moon and sounds like a great thing uh, to try to hitchhike on uh, the other uh, moon events, moon uh, uh, exploration and uh, 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 voyages to the moon. Uh, so great idea. Thanks for that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think that um, all these various tensions are, are ones that are subject to completely unknown systematics. That's the problem we have. And it's a bit like reading tea leaves. You know, you take your favorite this or that and um, argue for this. There is There are recent experiments coming in that do um, that don't all go in the direction of a high Hubble constant. And so I just think this is telling us that it's just too early to, to decide. And all the other tensions that the sig rate one you mentioned, again, that's being debated vigorously. And um, it looks as though as you, you know, add a parameter or so to the, um, to the Planck six parameter canonical ensemble that that gets weaker too. So um, I, I think, again, I think, it's just too early to say there is a problem with the model. You, ne you really need to get way, way beyond um, five sigma. We've had, you know, discoveries in the past in astronomy at the 10 sigma level that have gone away completely. So I, I think it's... Uh, you know, well, uh, so there are three uh, fairly detailed models that people have worked out. Uh, Mark Kaminkowski's group, Wayne Hu's group at the University of Chicago, and Lisa Randall and her group at Harvard. Uh, we picked uh, the Kaminkowski one to uh, do M-body simulations for. And the interesting result was that at redshift zero, the predictions are virtually identical to standard Lambda CDM. But as you go to higher redshift, you get a lot more structure formation, 50% more clusters at redshift one, for example, which will be easily tested uh, by the Evo Cita uh, satellite. So, uh, I think it's, you know, our job as theorists is not to know what's true. We have no idea what's true. Uh, we make various assumptions and work out the consequences. And this looks interesting to me. Yeah, I agree. I, lo I look forward to tests of these ideas. Right now, exactly. early dark energy seems like um, an incredibly ugly um, addition to Lemaitre's idea originally. But, you know, maybe we'll find evidence for this uh, and, or, you know, all, all the power to you if that, that works out. Okay, Enrique, you have a question from the Q&A? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Silk, for the wonderful talk. Uh, so here's a question by Hernan Gallego from the Q&A. So dark energy as a constant push or effect over space, does it violate energy conservation? Is there any counterpart effect that holds the symmetry? Um, no, I, I think it's just um, uh, a, a constant that's um, put in by hand um, into the, uh, uh, we have no understanding of, um, you know, energy conservation is not violated. So. <clears throat> okay, we have an interesting question from Gaspar Galaz that's aimed both at you, Joe, and also at Polo Infante. One of the promises of the EELT is to measure directly the expansion rate of the universe, thanks to hopefully the development of ultra stable spectrographs using quantum optics. We need to reach very high precisions um, uh, over the next decade to achieve this. If this is done, 
it will allow us to quantify the nature of dark energy. So the question for Joe, are you optimistic about this? Do you expect surprises? And the question for Polo is, do you expect the GMT to have answers before the ELT? Okay, so I, it sounds like a wonderful experiment, but um, I, again, uh, very, very difficult. So let, let's wait and see um, if it can come up with any interesting uh, puzzles that deviate from our current knowledge. Okay, and Polo, what's your opinion on the GMT? Ah, uh, tough question. Eh? Um, but well, uh, GMT is uh, been delayed now for a couple of years uh, because of uh, funding uh, problems uh, at the NSF uh, level. The ELT is going; uh, um, it's it's going uh, much better. I think right now, but uh, the construction time for the ELT is longer than for the GMT. So I don't know, uh, there's a competition there. Um, I guess uh, both telescopes are beyond, beyond 2030. Uh, and uh, I don't know, uh, it may be that GMT could come up uh, before the, G the ELT. Hard to say. Yeah. Uh, Jorge, do you have a comment on this? Uh, you're muted. I, 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 I have a question more than a comment. The, the question, and at the beginning, a comment. You, you, there is a, this experiment that is going to come to Chile, which is the CTA, the Chilean Telescope Array. It has a, a, a very important application. It is one of the, the motivation to detect dark, dark matter. And also some possibilities uh, to detect the effect of quantum gravity, especially Lorentz invariance violation. What do you think about the perspective of this uh, uh, experiment to, to really get uh, uh, close to detecting dark matter? Well, I, I think it's, um, it's wonderful for dark matter um, because um, the TV range of candidate particles is to some extent still a continuation of the natural range that we've been working on for so many years. Um, supersymmetric type predictions. And there's a big gap when you get um, between a TV and the unitarity limit of roughly 100 TV. And filling up that gap by looking for evidence from gamma rays, from annihilations, is a wonderful thing to do. At the same time, one can also address the lower part of that range with um, improved direct detection experiments. So multi-signature is possible there, which to me makes it very exciting and it's it's not disfavored that much by theory. So I, I'm excited by that. Um, yeah, for, for the Lorentz violation stuff, I, I really ha have no idea what to expect there. <laughs> it's an important limit to set, obviously. <clears throat> okay, I'll take another question from the Q&A. So the question at the very top is from Leonardo Castaneda. Nowadays, physics is looking at, at modified gravity and cosmology plays an important role as a scenario to test this possibility. How do you see the future of modified gravity in observational cosmology in the next few years? So my biggest problem with modified gravity, it's um, you know, a very interesting theory. Um, the, the MOND version was very simple. It's gradually got, gotten um, you know, bells and whistles over the years to make it Lorentz invariant. The problem is it has an incredibly difficult time in accounting for the cosmic microwave background fluctuations. When, um, and we know that gravity played a major role, dark matter played a major role in the standard view of explaining their amplitude and not just their amplitude, but the, but the structure in the um, fluctuation power spectrum. So when I see a, a convincing prediction of, um, of the scalar and the tensor modes from modified gravity models, I, I would take them a little more seriously. But the one so far, I think, um, failed that test as far as I, as far as I know. Okay, uh, let's go to Max next. Sorry, you, me. Max. Yes. Yeah, thank you, great. Thank you, Joe, for this um, wonderful, wonderful talk. It's great to see you again. Um, I have many questions on the science side, but I will concentrate on a different one, on the political side. Uh, what does it mean to really going into the moon? I'm, I'm worried about the, well, the first question is, 
how advanced is this project? Is NASA involved, for example? Are they talking yeah. about it or not? And so let, let me the, let me just complement the question is, um, for example, in Antarctica, there's a treaty, there's an international treaty that nobody owns Antarctica. For example, um, nobody can ask you for a passport. If you're in Antarctica, nobody can ask you for a passport. You, you have the right to walk in Antarctica without anyone uh, being able to, to make any questions about that. So how would that work in the moon? Would it be, you think people, presidents or politicians will be clever and long sighted enough to, to talk about these issues before actually <laughs> starting building a colony in the moon? Yeah, so we do have an international space treaty which covers the moon among other bodies, and but it's not very restrictive. I mean, you're not supposed to send military there. But that you know, anyway, um, the 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 agencies and there's a lot to be done there. That's for sure. Imagine one of the activities on the moon would be mining. Can you imagine the arguments there might be about exploitation, mining rights, etc., or fuel uh, supplies from ice, etc. So at the moment. Um, NASA is planning um, what's called the Lunar Gateway. It would be an orbiting space station around the moon beginning in 2024. And from that, they will um, launch um, uh, pods that go down to the surface and put the first woman on the moon, among other things, which is what they're promising us. Uh, China will do something similar. They will maybe go directly to the moon, but also they talk about the first woman on the moon too. Um, and the, so these are the beginnings, uh, you know, only four, four years away. Um, uh, after that, um, the plans are to, um, you know, make repeated trips to the moon and, and develop robotic resources and actually um, maybe make more permanent habitations as, as the European Space, space Agency is, is, is envisioning. So, so and, the, uh, and of course, one of the drivers in all of this will be tourism. You can imagine, you know about the demand we have for people to, to pay fortunes to go up and orbit around the earth once or twice, or um, orbit around the moon, far more, 50 million or something, per ticket or whatever. Imagine, you know, going to a resort on the moon and uh, playing golf or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. So I, 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 I think there'll be a huge commercial issue here. And that, in a way, that's a good thing because science can reap some of the benefits of all that investment on the moon. Um, it, it certainly is driving the effort to go to the moon. And then, you know, the, the mining aspects are interesting. We're running out of rare elements on the earth, especially. Um, and there's a vast resource on the moon, which has developed over billions of years, et cetera, from cosmic ray bombardment, et cetera, and, and you know, meteorite bombardment. So yeah, the moon um, has, I think we're, we're going there. Um, NASA sees it in part also as a gateway to Mars, of course, um, but for many reasons, um, uh, you know, I, I'm saying, well, why not? When, when we're on the moon, um, let, let's do some science, especially on the far side, build telescopes and things. I think that's a, a great activity to do. It'll be partly robotic, partly human, and that there'll be fewer political uh, problems uh, in dividing things up with those, because those we know work internationally already. Okay, let's go to Daniel next. Okay, thank you, Joe, for the nice talk. I was, you were stressing especially the new constraints we should uh, come up with from observations to test the models. I was wondering before the time we will have this new data, do you think uh, young people should uh, get engaged and, and try to work on uh, theoretical models? Uh, and do you think, for example, there is room and possibilities for alternative explanations or serious contenders to dark matter or dark energy? Or is that something which is uh, um, not of interest, if I may put it like that? Yeah. So I, I, I you know, in, in my talk, and you know, I, I followed the mainstream view. Okay, that, that um, so far we have a, a beautiful theory um, from Lemaitre onwards, and I see, um, apart from this discussion of the Hubble tension, which I think is plagued by systematics, um, I see no real. Um, crying need for alternatives. However, having said that, it's very important to have alternatives. I think you must explore modified gravity and, and some of these other issues um, and test these things. And uh, we're gonna do this you know, with experiments like Event Horizon Telescope, for example, and um, uh, especially, and, and um, other, uh, you know, gravity waves too. So these are wonderful strong field tests of gravity. So that should go ahead. 
what I'd like to see for the moon is more theoretical studies of what one could do um, on the moon. How how one how well could one attack the first star problem? You know, um, the simulations so far are a bit dated of what the first stars might be. Not everyone agrees on how massive they are. But they come in many clusters of many stars, whatever. Um, that, 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 that's a wonderful target. Um, <clears throat> likewise, you know, foundational experiments like looking for deviations from the black body, nature of the cosmic ray background, that, that's fundamental too. And we can best do that, I think, on, on the moon too, because of its um, you know, lack of atmosphere, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There are downfalls, obviously, the moon is not a perfect environment for other reasons, um, and it all has to be explored much more carefully. Okay, we'll take two more questions. Let's go to Thomas next. Okay, I wanna pick your brain a little bit more about uh, primordial black holes. So there is a question here in the Q&A by Stephen Ridgway, and um, I'm getting this as an inspiration for asking you about what the, so if primordial black holes exist, right, um, Hawking radiation evaporation would make them, right, some of the masses would be expected to evaporate in the nearby universe. So what would be the signature of, of these evaporation flashes? Or perhaps have we observed them already as, you know, fast radio bursts or gamma ray bursts? Or what, what, are, what is your thinking about this? Okay, okay, so sure, there are signatures. Um, if, if they evaporate not too far away, um, there'd be cosmic ray, uh, interesting cosmic ray predictions. Um, presumably you'd make um, electron positron pairs in great numbers, you'd make gamma rays, things like this. Uh, people have looked for these things um, and set limits, um, you know, from space from the outer solar system to gamma ray, et cetera. We found no evidence of any evaporating black holes. If they, if they're a little bit less massive, they would evaporate in the early universe. And then the main signature there is some distortion of the microwave background. So as I said in my talk, we haven't seen that yet either, but you know, once we find that, if we ever find that, then one could debate what the source might be. And I'm sure evaporating black holes would be a very good candidate. Um, but I think they're a good candidate for dark matter at this point. Um, some of them, uh, the solar mass range ones, um, can basically uh, fill the two mass gaps that have been found naturally. They would occur at higher redshift. That's a potential test for primordial black holes than the, the events that we're seeing so far in, in, you know, showing up in the stochastic background perhaps. So there are many ways to, um, to test this hypothesis. And as far as the whole dark matter goes, if you have a wide enough mass range of these primordial black holes, then there's certainly a mass range where um, the, the properties are so unknown, they could be the dark matter. And this is the lower mass range, sub subsolar, sub sublunar actually. But that's a, an interesting option too, that people are exploring by microlensing, et cetera, and haven't got the answer yet. So I think it's a very exciting field um, with potential, but not really any, you know, absolutely no detections yet. Okay, and let's finish with a question from Alejandro. Hi, uh, nice hearing uh, your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I would like to go back to the issue of the um, uh, dark energy. I was among the first human beings on, on being surprised by the uh, measurement of a dark logical uh, constant back in 1998. Then among the first, I guess, to be excited about the possibility of setting constraints on the W parameter of the universe just by enlarging the uh, supernova uh, sample from tens of them to hundreds of them. And then I guess among the first to be depressed by the fact that we were just zeroing in minus one as the value of uh, W, the equation of state parameter of the universe. So. If the early universe, I mean, be, before the Big Bang, the universe was like a lavish or prodigal creator of in the different universe that would pump up out of the background fluctuations and um, space time fluctuations. And then only those that would allow for uh, conditions good enough for observers to prosper and ask questions uh, are those that are going to harbor observers like us. So 
that is the anthropic cosmological principle will explain the values of those constants, but not physics. So what will be your taking your position regarding that possibility? If so, we, have to, if we do have to live with the cosmological constant. Yes, so um, I take it to be a constant. That's my particular view and um, we don't have an understanding of it. There are these anthropic explanations of it, but I worry about anthropic explanations for the following reason. If you go back a few hundred years, you'll find that the, um, the position of the earth in the solar system and the other planets was something very special, you know. And now we understand that with modern theories um, much more recently. So physics comes in to address seemingly very special things, incredibly special things. We have examples of that. Um, so I, I, it, I would, my, my hope would be that someday, not tomorrow, but within the next century or two, there'll be a new Einstein or Lemaitre who will come up with um, a convincing explanation of why um, lambda is so constant and why w is so close to minus one. Um, I think there's physics out there that we haven't begun to probe. We don't have a theory of quantum gravity yet, etc. So um, um, I, I would, uh, you know, that, that's the direction I would go. In. So we are, you are still not depressed about that. Absolutely not. No, I, I think it's exciting that there's room there for someone brilliant to make a real contribution someday. So. <laughs> okay. okay, let's uh, let's wrap up there. So thank you uh, everyone for joining us today for Joe's talk, and thank you very much to you, Joe, for taking the time to tell us about your work and about the future of cosmology. Uh, please be so kind to fill out the survey at the end of the Zoom webinar, uh, and our next scheduled talk will be on October 9th, which is next Friday. Uh, and will be given by Makoto Yoshikawa, principal investigator of the Hayabusa 2 mission that will bring a comet sample back to Earth on December 6th. Dr. Yoshikawa will be telling us about the challenges of the asteroid sample return mission Hayabusa 2. Uh, so for now, stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and until the next web golden webinar, goodbye. Thank you, bye.